Hello and welcome to Kansas Fest 2011. Yay. Thank you everybody for being here. I'm glad to see that no storms or accidents or Vespas stopped you from being here. It's going to be a great year. It already is. It already is. It already is. We have over 40 attendees this year, which has not happened in a long time. Yay. We have... Yay. <laughs> And before we get it right into the keynote, I thought we'd take a moment because we have six first-timers this year. Uh, we have, from last year, seven first-timers who have all come back. We have several people who are back this year after a couple years off. So there are a lot of new and unfamiliar faces. And I thought it might be neat to take just like maybe 20 seconds each to stand up, say maybe who you are, where you're from, and maybe something like what you do for a living or what you do with your Apple II. Try to keep it like under 20 seconds a person. But just a quick introduction, so I'll start. Uh, my name is Ken Gagney. I am <coughs> from central Massachusetts. My day job is an editor at Computer World Magazine, and at night I'm editor and publisher of the Apple II newsletter, Deuce GS. So you don't have to say, hi, Ken, because I'm not an alcoholic. Hi, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ivan. We'll, we'll save that for you. But why don't we start with you, sir? Jeff Weiss. Um, involved with GCS, Apple II development, and other random things, and in the real world, IT manager. Where? Maryland? At uh, college, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Ah, take it. I am Ivan Drucker. This is my third Kansas Fest, and I write for Juice GS sometimes, and I am a Mac consultant <coughs> in New York City. New York City. I'm James Mank. Yeah, I'm from Lake Tahoe. What? What? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm Danny, all right? I'm <laughs> at Lake Tahoe, and uh, I use my Apple II for stupid computer tricks. <laughs> Don't we all do so? <laughs> and I'm Tony Diaz, uh, from Oceanside, California. I make uh, RC aircraft that I started doing with laser cutting, and I'm looking to do any Apple II stuff with the said machine because I've got to make money off of it. I run, uh, sell Syndicom stuff now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, 16 sector peripherals, and I'm this year's KFest sponsor, and I have been to every single one of these events. And so the year we don't have it is the year, is the one I don't the one, the one I'll miss. So as long as I'm here, we're going to do it. Great. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Martin Hay. Uh, this is my third Kansas Fest. Um, eight bits all the way. <laughs> and in my other life, I'm 64 bits all the way. I'm a Java programmer uh, for the California Digital Library. I'm Daniel Kuzma from Detroit. Uh, I write web software for uh, ABS, PC, for Word, for Apple II. Um, I'm starting to write HTML stuff, but I also did uh, network driver for Apple II. I'm Scott Dore from Lafayette, Louisiana, a part of Cajun country, and uh, work for a web design firm. I do PHP and MySQL programming, and oddly enough, I've never owned an Apple II, but I've used them quite a bit in school, so I'm just here to see what's up. There will be a test on this later. <laughs> <coughs> I'm Matthew Hellinger uh, from Birmingham, Alabama. I run a web, web development company, not the way all that stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, this is my first year at Kansas Fest, so I'm going to get down to the I'm Herb Kenyon. I'm a .NET developer out of Salt Lake City, Utah. This is my second Kansas Fest. I've been involved with Apple II since 1979, but uh, I don't do anything here. 
Stanford. I uh, I used to code in the Apple II back then in 1981. And uh, I, uh, for my day job, I am uh, in charge of developer documentation in Mozilla. I'm Roy Bainwood. I got in Texas with the Apple II in 1985 and 
Well, we each had 20 seconds to introduce ourselves, so goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm here. I didn't go to the comic book convention either. I usually go, I, I think I've gone to most of the San Diego conventions and since they first started. I haven't gone recently because uh, I moved to Paradise and it's a little too far to go to San Diego all the time. But here I am also. And uh, Scott is also wearing a shirt with the Apollo astronauts on it, I guess. <laughs> Today is the, is the anniversary of the first lunar landing with Neil Armstrong. It happened on July 20th, 1969. And on July 20th, 1976 was the first landing on Mars by the Viking spacecraft. So today is kind of a special day in the history of space. Uh, I'm also an amateur astronomer. I've been into astronomy all my life. And I'd like before I start, I'd like to just mention something that most of you may not be aware of if you're familiar with or keep up with uh, astronomy. As of about two, maybe three weeks ago, the Earth has started moving toward the sun. And it's picking up speed. They probably haven't mentioned this on the newscast or anything. It's picking up speed and will continue to pick up speed. And then over the course of the next several weeks, it will be approaching the sun faster than the speed of a jet airliner. Just to let you know, you, you heard it from me first. Maybe the news will cover it, who knows. But uh, just to let you know, I'll talk more about that later. Well, I thought I'd start off by talking about how I got into personal computing and how that led to my getting my first Apple II. Now, most of, most of what I was going to talk about, I guess, was kind of sketchily outlined in the introduction here. But let me go back a little bit and fill in some of the gaps. Uh, I'd like to start off, I guess, when I was in college. I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I was a physics major. And I was... Uh, I was, it was summertime, it was between semesters or whatever, and I stayed up there during the summer to, uh, instead of going home, and I had a part-time job working in the math physics library. Now, th those of you who aren't familiar with the University of Wisconsin campus, it's uh, on the edge of a lake, Lake Mendota, and uh, it has a sailing club and an outing club and, and swimming, canoeing. So all the students who enroll for summer school are really just there for a vacation, basically. So nobody is going to go sit in the math physics library. <laughs> so I was in there pretty much by myself. But I had signed up for a class in Fortran programming in the fall semester. And I figured, well, there's nobody in the library. I might as well start uh, getting a head start. Uh, there's a book behind the checkout desk said Fortran programming by Daniel McCracken. It was a big black cover book, soft cover, about the size of a magazine. So I started glancing through there just to see what it was all about, because I was really not too much interested in computers or programming. Well, by the time I read the book, it was about three days later I finished it and wrote my first computer program. And it was a, the first program was a problem I was working on when I was in high school and never solved. Imagine a square, and inside the square is a point three inches from one corner, five inches and seven inches. The question was, how big is the square? You might want to try working on that one yourself. I never did solve it. I haven't thought about working on it recently, but I didn't solve it back then. So I wrote a program that would actually uh, iterate to see what, what solutions would fit those parameters. And so that was my first computer program I ever wrote. Now, ironically enough, it wasn't the first program I got to run. <laughs> because uh, there's an axiom that programs never work right the first time. Well, that was no exception. And back in those days, you had to punch them up on cards, turn them into a, a clerk, and they'd run it overnight, and the next day you come back and get your error. Forgot a comma somewhere. <laughs> so it took a while to get that program to work. And while I was waiting, I started my second program, which was a program to generate prime numbers. No biggie, but you know, I was just a beginner. And ironically, that worked the first time. So my second program became the first program to work, <laughs> and my first program was the second program I got to work. Now, the, as I said, in those days, you, you had to turn in things on punch cards because there were only mainframe computers. They were big, about the size of this room, actually. Air-conditioned, false floor, uh, tape drives, the whole business. They didn't, the concept of a personal computer was just ridiculous. 
Well, eventually the physics department uh, got a CDC 3600 computer, and uh, that gave me a two-hour turnaround. So instead of 24 hours, I was down to two hours. So a big step forward. Well, let me jump ahead here to when I was in graduate school. I went to UCLA, and there they had a computer club, and they would get, give students two minutes a day on the computer. So I did uh, some programming in there, and, uh, well, I won't get into all that. <laughs> so after, after grad school, uh, I worked at Xerox for a few years, and then I went to the Jet Propulsion Lab. While I was at JPL, I worked on several space program projects like Apollo, Apollo 17, actually, and infrared astronomy and a few other things. I want to get back to what I brought up at the beginning here about the sun and the earth. I told that to a couple of my friends. And I purposely phrased it the way I did because I wanted to get a reaction. The earth is indeed moving towards the sun. But what I didn't tell them is that it does that every year. The earth is in an elliptical orbit. Ranges from 94 and a half million to 91 and a half. So there's a three million mile difference you have to cover in six months. If you do the arithmetic, you'll see that com that comes out faster than a jet plane can fly. So that's that's all there is to that. It's no big deal. It's not like we're going to crash into the sun. <laughs> yeah, darn it! I know. I was hoping for. <laughs> what? And it sure would have. <laughs> Okay, well, I was at JPL. I was the, the head of the science, science, down, science ground data handling group, which was the programming group. I had about 20 employees under me. We had, uh, we eventually got our, an old IBM 7044, which was another one of these big mainframes. And since it was essentially my computer, it was my first personal computer, in a sense. Not one I could take home, but it was, I could do pretty much anything I wanted. So that, I had some fun playing with that. Then around 1975, I started seeing ads in magazines for <coughs> the first true personal computers. There were MSI and Altair, uh, but they were all kits. You had to build them. Of course, you see these two things, I got eight more. So I, I, I'm not much for building kits. So I had to wait until, uh, well, actually, there was another company, too. I don't know, how many of you heard of uh, Sphere, Sphere Corporation? Yeah, they advertised something called a Microsphere. And when I saw that, I got very excited. It was a, magazine ads had pictures of this computer, something like, uh, like an Apple would have been. It had a, a black and white screen, and they showed a tic-tac-toe game on it. And I was very in, in, in th in th enthused about that thing. It was supposed to be fully assembled and everything. And the guy who was the head of the company was a guy named Michael Weiss. And I kept calling him just like every week. Is it coming out yet? Is it coming out? And he says, oh, we're working on it. It's coming out. They never did come out with them, unfortunately. But in 1976, I saw another ad for a computer that was at, supposed to be priced at $666.66. <laughs> Fully assembled, so they said. Well, that was the old Apple I. Uh, of course, what you call fully assembled today is just a motherboard. So I drove, uh, the ad said 770 Welsh Road in, Cooper, uh, in Palo Alto. So I drove up to 770 Welsh Road, and it turns out it was like a big building with lots of windows, and I said, wow, this is a big company they got there. And I walked inside, and I said, I'd like to talk about this Apple One computer. And they said, oh, you have to contact Steve Jobs. And so they gave me his number, and I went over to his house, knocked on the door. He wasn't there at the time, but his mother invited me in. <laughs> <laughs> And a few minutes later, here was this guy in his 20s with a scruffy beard and sandals, came walking up the, the sidewalk. And I got introduced to Steve Jobs for the first time. And he took me out to his garage and showed me the Apple I. Now, he, he couldn't quite get the thing to work. He took me out and he said, well, here's the Apple I. He started doing it. Uh, did Waz tell me to do it? No, that doesn't work. huh? No, no, that doesn't work either. Anyway, he tried to show me some stuff. He finally got things to work to the point that I was pretty convinced I wanted one anyway, even if he couldn't get it to work. But I didn't, well, at that time, they weren't selling them. I mean, they were selling them, but through mail order. 
Now I had a, a, an a fellow employee uh, named Gordon Culp at the Jet Propulsion Lab. He was starting a company which was going to be a computer company and he was going to sell assembled computers. So he said he would sell me a finished Apple I in a case with a keyboard for about a thousand dollars. And so I said, sure, I'll go for that. So in October of 76, I finally did get my first home computer, an Apple I. Now the Apple I had no graphics, no color. It was pretty primitive, it had 4K of memory. You could expand it to 8K, which you needed if you were going to run BASIC. And BASIC was available only on cassette. Well, I got the, I got the computer and over the next several months played around. And I did a Star Trek program written in BASIC. And I sent a copy somewhere. I don't know how it got to Interface Age magazine, but they said they were going to publish it. And so they did. And that was my first publication in a personal computer magazine. Now, Apple, as time went on, Apple wasn't sure whether they were going to upgrade the Apple I and add graphics or if they were going to come out with a whole new computer. Well, it turns out they didn't upgrade, so they came out with the Apple II, which was kind of disappointing because that meant I had to buy a whole new computer. So in 1977, they started advertising the Apple II. $1,678 was the initial price, but it was fully assembled. It wasn't like the Apple I. And there weren't any computer stores back in those days, so you couldn't just walk in and look at one and take it home. So I went up to Apple, and I met with uh, Steve Wozniak, Mike Markula. They had a small office building in Cupertino. And I explained the problem. I said, I bought this Apple I, and I want to get this new Apple II you've got, but I can't afford it because they're... You know, I can't spend another 1500 bucks. So Waz and Markle went off into a back room. About five or ten minutes later, they came back out and said, I'll tell you what, you give us your Apple I back and some few hundred dollars, and we'll give you a new Apple II. Well, that was great, because uh, the only way I was going to be able to get one. So I waited for my, my Apple II to be delivered, and they said it was going to come on July 3rd. Well, I waited all day for UPS to deliver it, and it didn't show up. So July 4th was the next day. They don't deliver on July 4th. So that was the lousiest 4th of July in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, at 10 o'clock in the morning, the next day, UPS comes, and I got my Apple, Apple computer finally. Great day. I opened it up, took it out of the box, hooked up the TV monitor, turned turned it on, nothing. It just sat there. I unplugged it, plugged it back in, figured something was wrong. Just sat there. Nothing. No beep, no nothing. And I think, oh great, just my luck. I'm going to have to send it back now and wait another couple of weeks to get a new one. So, well, somehow I, got, I pushed all the buttons on the keyboard and I finally pushed the reset button and that made it come alive. I, had, I guess I was too impatient to read the manual that tells you how to turn the thing on or something. Well, I finally did. By the way, the, the, the serial number on my Apple II was 0013, the 13th Apple II. Now, that's kind of significant, pardon the pun, the first two digits, 0013. Now, they didn't say 13, and they didn't say 0000013. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, they only had two zeros. That kind of implies they didn't expect to sell more than a couple thousand of them. <laughs> and la I, I later looked at my Apple, and I have several Apple IIs at home. One of them, one of the later ones, was like a six-digit serial number. So I guess they decided to start putting more zeros on or something. Now, as you all know, that the, the Apple II was uh, came with 16K, had low-res, high-res graphics, and it only had cassette input. Now, some of you who may have come in later had the, the disc that you could use. Well, the original Apple II didn't have a disc, and it came with a slotless case. You didn't have the ventilation slots on the side. And uh, the case I had ended up melting because they didn't have any place for the heat to escape, and so my case had a sag in it. <laughs> and I took it back to Apple, and they gave me a new case, a whole, a whole new case to, for my computer. 
I, I kind of wish I'd have kept the old one now, just for historical reasons, but at the time, you know, you want to get the latest and greatest, and you have a chance to upgrade free, well, you can't pass it up. Same thing with the Apple One. I mean, I'd like to have kept that one, too. But if I had, I wouldn't have been able to get an Apple II. Um, I don't know. Okay, anyway, I got my computer, turned it on, and I started playing around with it. And uh, there was virtually no documentation for how to use graphics. There were no graphics uh, subroutines or anything. So I had to start playing on, with it on my own. So I started experimenting. I found out if you typed in hexadecimal C050, C057, it turns on graphics mode. And if you start putting hex numbers into location 2000, you start seeing dots appear on the screen. So I went through all that garbage and found out the screen kind of kind of went across the top, and then came down to here, and then came down to here, and then nothing happened for about eight bytes or so. And then it came down about an inch or so and came across here, and oh, it was really weird. Anyway, I went through all that stuff, figured it out, wrote some graphics routines, and by the next morning, I wrote Rocket Pilot, the very first high-res graphics game. In fact, I think I might even have brought some show and tell things here. This is this is the copy of what you can't really see it, rocket pilot. We had to fly a rocket over a mountain and land on the other side. Uh, it's kind of a rinky dink game by today's standards, but it was the first. Well, good enough. Later after that, I came up with Saucer Invasion, uh, Space Maze, and Star Wars. And those became the very first four high-res graphics games ever made for the Apple computer. So it was on my road to starting getting published, finally. I guess my first thing was that article on Star Trek for, Kill uh, for Interface Age. And now I had these other games I came out with. And then in 1978, in April, of 78, came out with another, uh, let's see, this was all done in cassette tapes in those days because they didn't have floppy disks. So here's a cassette tape with Apple Vision. Now this says copyright 1977 R. Bishop. It's a misprint on Apple's part because I didn't, I didn't do it until April of 78. But so they, they goofed on the label. Well, that, that was 78. Well, the rest of 78 turned out to be a very, very busy year for me. In addition, in addition to working at JPL, I was teaching classes. In fact, one of the classes I was <coughs> teaching was at a computer store down near Long Beach. I think it was called Computer Playground. And I was teaching a class, I think it was, a it was either a class in, in basic or in assembly language, I don't remember. But I'd been laying in bed the night before, uh, one of my classes, and I was thinking about how the Apple stores uh, information on cassettes and reads it back in. And all it does really is look at zero crossings. And so I, I got the idea, what happens if I were to talk through a microphone and feed it into the computer. What would, what would, the, what would the computer see? And, uh, well, I'd see a bunch of zero crossings, and I said, well, what happens if you play those back through, the, through a speaker? So I got up and tried that, wrote a very short little assembly language program, samples the input port, plays back through the output. And when I talked through it, I could hear my voice. Kind of, kind of, it was very distorted, but it was recognizable. So I quickly wrote a little program, took maybe a half an hour at the most, to read the microphone, store it in memory, and then play back the stored ones and zeros. And the very first thing I did was, the thing I recorded was, hello, I'm Apple Talker, the voice synthesizing program that will run on any Apple computer. So I took this down to my class the next day, and I played it for my students. And everybody just kind of sat there. And I figured, well, I guess they didn't like it. Finally, somebody said, do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was one of, the, one, of the, one of the things I was doing. I was also working at C, for CBS on the Tic Tac Do show, as, as was mentioned. 
And uh, they had nine Apple computers there running the show. And the, they were controlled. They were actually slave computers to a, it was either an Altair or an IMSA, I forget what it was. Each one of those screens was an Apple II? Yeah, each one was a separate Apple II. That was all done with yeah, an Apple awesome. II. Each each I computer had an Apple had a Dragon in it. Yeah, so in case it needed to to show it, it would show it. And they were all being controlled by another main, uh, smaller computer that somebody else uh, did the programming for. So on the on the day of the uh, public, uh, what do they call it? The uh, the prototype, the pilot for those shows. We had a live audience, and uh, Wink Martindale was in there, and everybody, and. Uh, we said, okay, let's see the categories. Nothing happened. It just froze. And I said, oh my God, what did I do wrong? So it was either me or this other guy. And one of us was going to have egg on his face. Turned out to be him. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I worked, that was one of the things I was doing that year. I was also flown to Amsterdam as a consultant to Merck Sharp Dome. They were working on some kind of a marketing program that they needed some help on. Disney. Well, I'm a Disney collector. As I mentioned, I collect comic books. In fact, here's a picture, a picture I drew of Donald Duck. And somebody printed, I don't remember who printed it out, but somebody printed it out and presented it to me on a frame like this many years ago. This was done with the Apple graphics tablet. Anyway, I got, I was invited to the Disney Studios for the first time as an official consultant, which, you know, for me is a big thrill because here I'm a Disney collector and I finally got to go down, down to the Disney studios in Burbank and uh, inter not interviewed, but consulted on some small project. And there were a bunch of other small things I did during that year, one of which was I got married. I guess that would be a small thing. And then later that year, I was up at a computer show in San Francisco <coughs> with my wife and Apple was showing some, some new something or other. And uh, me and my wife were standing in a crowd. And there were two, two guys in front of us, about late teens, maybe 20-ish or so. And Apple was showing a Star Wars game. It was a much better game than the one I had done, because they put more time into it. And I was standing there, and one of these kids turned to the other and said, that's just a ripoff of one of Bob Bishop's games. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who he was. And my wife said to me, why, in my ear, she says, why don't you introduce yourself to him? And I said, no, 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 I'm too shy to do that. But it was, it was interesting that somebody had actually heard of me. <laughs> well, it, in spite of all this stuff, Apple had continued to kind of ignore me. No, Apple never made me a job offer. They never contacted me to do anything. I was kind of just a nobody. Then in the autumn of 78, Atari made me a job offer. So they, they took me up to their computer, to their laboratory, showed me around. I noticed on one of the benches was a, a cartridge. Uh, it was labeled speech recognition. And I kind of walked over and picked it up. And he said, oh yeah, we got that idea from your Apple Talker program that you were working on. So anyway, they made me, a, they made me a, an offer. And I was happy at JPL. I didn't feel like leaving, so I said, no thanks. Didn't want to go to Atari. A few weeks later, they came back and offered more money. So I said, well, I guess they really want me. So I gave my notice at JPL, told Atari I was going to accept their offer. And about three days later, I got a phone call from Apple. And Apple said, we'd like to come have you come talk to us. And I said, well, I've already accepted another job offer somewhere. And they said, yeah, we know all about it. We want to talk to you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up to Apple. And I met with uh, Steve Wozniak, Mike Scott, the president of the company, and Tom Whitney, the executive vice president of engineering. And the four of us sat around all Saturday afternoon, answering any questions I had, held nothing back from me, no secrets. And they ended up making me an offer to top Atari's offer. In addition, they also offered me a three-year stock option. And in fact, Waz said, someday with the stock, you'll be able to buy a house. <laughs> well, he was, uh, that was an understatement, I guess. <laughs> 
See, back in those days, Apple regarded Atari as the biggest competitor. It wasn't like today where, you know, I guess Windows might be considered the biggest uh, comp competitors. Anyway, so here I was. I accepted an offer from Atari, and now Apple was making me a bigger offer. So what am I going to do? Well, fate stepped in, and I got a call from Atari saying that, uh, by the way, the guy who had interviewed me was a guy named Al Alcorn, who was the vice president of Atari. And uh, he called up and said he had discussed the offer that he made me with Nolan Bushnell. And uh, Bushnell said, that's a conflict of interest. Oh, because I said, if I go to Atari, will I be able to continue doing Apple software on my own? And he said, no problem. You know, you work for Atari, what you do on your own time is your business. Well, Nolan Bushnell con uh, contradicted that and said, you can't do that. So I, they offered me an, the option to cancel my, uh, my uh, agreement to work for them, and which I did. And so I went to Apple. And by the way, Nolan Bush, uh, um, Al Elkhorn later became an Apple employee himself. So if I had gone to Atari, I don't know what would have happened. Well, anyway, in December, December of 1978, I became Apple employee number 187. Now, Waz had employee number one. Well, Jobs didn't like that. Jobs wanted to be the first one, so Jobs took employee number zero. <laughs> Now, on the, uh, on the org chart, what, what was my job at Apple? Well, they had an org chart where they had um, Tom Whitney was the executive vice president of the, of the whole engineering section. Underneath him were all the division managers or whatever. And off on the side was the secretary for the group, Dennis, uh, Janice, what was her name, Pratt, Pratt was her last name. And she was off on the side. And they stuck me off on the other side, so I was probably on the level of the secretary there. <laughs> uh, they didn't really know what to do with me. They were only concerned I didn't go to Atari. <laughs> so they, I could pretty much do whatever I wanted to. In fact, uh, Steve Jobs would occasionally pass me in the hallway and say, hey, Bob, you having fun? And I'd say, hey, yeah, it's OK, yeah. And he'd say, good, good, and he'd walk on. Uh, uh, occasionally, we'd have lunch together with Steve, jo uh, Steve Wozniak. Uh, Waz used to go out, you know, every lunch with the some of his friends, employees there, and we usually went to some place like the Pepper Mill, which was like right across the street. And Waz always forgot to bring his money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if he, I don't think he did it on purpose, but it's just like he never had money with him, and so we always ended up paying for his lunch. Um, some of the projects I worked on at Apple. Well, because I had done the Apple Talker and Apple Listener stuff, uh, one of the first projects I was working on was speech recognition, speech synthesis for Apple. Um, one, in fact, one of the shows, they had a show in New York City in which each of the groups at Apple were competing to see who could make the best marketing exhibit. And I worked on a, a program uh, which may, turned the Apple II into an oscilloscope, where you talk into a microphone and, and uh, displays the wave pattern on the screen. Anyway, we ended up, our, my group ended up winning first prize, and we all got out, went out to a free dinner at some fancy restaurant. I also worked on the Apple III, which was designed by Wendell Sander. And I had, I had an, most of the employees had cubicles. And uh, there were some, some of us were, were fortunate enough to actually get offices with closed doors on them. And I had an office that I had with Jeff Raskin who was the designer, or part of the designer, of the Macintosh. And he would occasionally show me his latest uh, ideas for the Mac and bounce them off me. So I had some minor contribution to designing the Macintosh, but very, very minor. And also, my second trip to, to the Disney Studios. Uh, some, some, uh, some of the um, employees from Disney had come up to Apple and they were trying to find some way to use computers in, I guess, one of the movies they were going to make. And so Apple had me talk to these guys. And uh, one of the guys was named Donald Kushner. And uh, I gave my presentation at Apple. And he said, well, if you're ever down in, in Burbank area, come in and visit me. And so I did. I went there and I said, I'd like to talk with Donald Kushner. 
and sure enough, he was there. He took me in and showed me what he was working on, gave me a tour of the sets he was working on. Um, and we spent, you know, hours and hours doing that. He spent a lot of time with me. And finally, I said, I thanked him, went home. Later on, the movie came out. The movie was called Tron. And the producer, Donald Kushner. <laughs> I thought he was an employee. I thought he was just some guy showing me around the sets there. And turns out he's the producer of the movie. He personally showed me the tour. <laughs> well, everything was going pretty good until 1981. That was the day of the infamous Black, I can't remember if it was Black Friday or Black Tuesday or something, Black something day of the week. And that was the day Apple got rid of 40 employees, of which I was one of them. And consequently, I lost one third of my stock option because it was a three year option. I'd only been there two years at that point. Now, ostensibly, they did that across the board. They got rid of secretaries. They got rid of, you know, not just all one group. Otherwise, it would have been too obvious what they were doing. They got rid of me. They got rid of my boss, uh, Tom Whitney. And uh, I don't remember how they justified it. I guess they were doing some house cleaning. But the reason, the real reason they did it was because they were trying to get back the stock they gave out as, as stock options. And the reason I know that is because the next day, Gene Carter, uh, who was the vice president of sales, can't call me and said, would I like to come work for him? And I said, oh, good. That means I can keep my stock option. He says, nope, that's gone, but you can come work for me if you, if you want to. So I said, no, thanks. <laughs> but anyway, so I lost one third of my option, kept the other two thirds. That was the only time in my life I ever got fired. <laughs> I also got divorced that year, so everything was going pretty bad there. And so I retired and moved to Santa Cruz. While I was in Santa Cruz, I continued writing programs and magazine articles. I had stuff in Creative Computing, and Byte Magazine, Kilobot, all kinds of, I've lost track of all the places I've been published in. I had a monthly column in Call Apple Magazine. It was called Modular Assembly Language Programming. And while I was in Santa Cruz, that's when I met Lucia Grossberger, who was a computer artist. She was uh, the, the person who made something called the Designer's Toolkit. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It was a, a graphics tablet thing. And so she and I got together and we worked on several projects. Well, actually, this one, this is MicroPaint. This is something I did before I met her, I guess. This is my version of, of some of the things. But we did uh, many projects together, one of which was the book Apple Visions, which uh, was published by Addison Wesley and has a foreword by Steve Wozniak. He wrote one page in the book somewhere. And he, he's got a bigger font than any of us. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was kind of an introductory book, very simple, cartoony, has uh, you know pictures and things like that. Uh, Lucia and I also worked on a lot of things together. We did the, we did the pack. I didn't bring the pack with me because it's too big, but these are it was a two-volume set, basically a two-volume book, which was uh, the Programmer's Assembly Language Construction Kit (PACK), and so it taught how to do assembly language programming on the Apple II. We also did something called Space Lace. Oh, that's MicroPainter. There's some refill. I, I guess I skipped over some stuff. Uh, part of MicroPainter, which I did, was a, a coloring book done for the Apple II. The pictures were done by Saul Bernstein, who was an artist. And he put, them, put pictures on the disk along with my software, and we sold it as a, co as a coloring book for, for kids or anybody to play with. And this is Space Lace. This was the interactive kaleidoscope that we created. Lucia really liked kaleidoscopes for some reason, so uh, we did some, did a product where you could make a kaleidoscope out of your apple. It was pretty easy to do. Uh, and while we were doing kaleidoscopes, uh, there was a, um, a SIGGRAPH conference in San Francisco back then, and uh, they had a a separate uh, exhibit at the San Francisco Museum of Art. 
in which uh, they showed computer art. And so Lucia enrolled us in that thing. And uh, we uh, had this big, she made a big tube about this long, this big around, with a TV set or a computer monitor at one side. And you go over here and look in the other side, and you see a kaleidoscope of whatever's on the TV screen. So that was exhibited at the San Francisco Museum of Art. So I guess I'm a, a, an authorized artist now because I actually had an exhibit in, in, a, in a reputable museum. Uh, one of the most interesting, interesting things that happened in, in conjunction with Lucia, she got sick one day and uh, she said she was going to be home in bed. And so I went over to visit her a few hours later, knocked on her door, no answer. I figured, well, she's in bed, maybe she's asleep, maybe she's sick. So I went, I opened the door and went inside, the door was unlocked. The burglar alarm went off. And so I went to look in the bedroom, she's not home. She's nowhere in the house and the burglar alarm's going off. And I tried to go to the telephone to call out and it was, the telephone line was dead because of the burglar alarm did some stuff and wouldn't let you make calls. Finally, the alarm went off and I was able to make a call. So I called 911 and I said, I'm in this house, the burglar alarm went off. And the person on the other says, uh, just stay where you are, but go out, uh, hang up the phone and walk out to the living room. There are two police officers waiting for you. <laughs> so I did. I walked out there, and they both had their guns on me. <laughs> I said, uh, anyway, it was, very, it was kind of scary. I don't know if you had guns pointed at you. It isn't a fun thing to do. Anyway, I finally was able to uh, identify myself. And... Uh, they still didn't know who I was. I, mean, I could have been anybody. And so what I, I just happened to have a copy of uh, my uh, Apple Vision's book in the car. So I had one of the policemen accompany me out. And I said, look, Bob Bishop, Lucia Grossberger. <laughs> so that, that showed them that I was actually not just a burglar, but somebody who could be there. So they left. And there I was in the house. And now I couldn't leave again without the burglar alarm going off. <laughs> so I had to wait for Lucia to come back, and everything turned out to be OK. Um, while I was in Santa Cruz also, there was another man I met named Michael Zwirling. And he was, um, he was the, the leader of a group called SCAUG, S-C-A-U-G, which is Santa Cruz area, Santa Cruz Apple Users Group. And he held uh, you know, meetings like we're having, basically. And uh, I went to one of his meetings, and I met him. And uh, well, in a nutshell, he eventually asked me. What, he, well, eventually, he I became his friend, and he also later became the owner of KSCO Radio, a 10,000 watt radio station in Santa Cruz. In fact, it's the main Central Coast station there. And he asked me if I wanted to do a show, talk show. Uh, well, I wasn't at all interested because I'm not, I'm not much into public speaking, as you can see. So I said no. But he kept insisting and insisting. He said, I got a, I got a company that will sponsor you for, for three months, Wolf Computer. Just try it for three months. OK. I said, OK, OK, I'll, I'll give it a try. So 10 years later, I was still doing the show. <laughs> but uh, the things I did on my show, I interviewed Waz actually several times. And I gave puzzle questions, and I gave away prizes to whoever answered the questions. And uh, I talked about something which later turned out to be called fuzzy logic. Do you all know what fuzzy logic is? Does anybody not know what it is? Oh. <laughs> well, fuzzy logic, well, it's, it's kind of an extension of what might be called crisp logic. Where in, set, in set theory, if you have a Venn diagram, they usually draw them as circles uh, with a well-defined inside and everything else is outside. And in fuzzy, in fuzzy set theory, uh, there aren't crisp boundary lines. Things kind of blend. So uh, whether something's a member of a set or not a member of the set becomes uh, ambiguous, and there's a, something called a membership function, which can be some value other than zero or one. Uh, I don't want to get too much into it, but basically I, I was talking about stuff like that, only it wasn't in mathematical terms. It was uh, something which I had come up with on my own, and one of my listeners called in and says, hey, what you're talking about is actually called fuzzy logic. And I looked into it, and sure enough, somebody beat me to it. <laughs> Anyway, I did that show for 10 years, and I also interviewed Steve Allen at one time. And they interviewed astronauts and scientists and all kinds of things. I eventually uh, sold my house in Santa Cruz and bought a motorhome. 
and I traveled all over the United States. I've been to every state and every state capital and every Canadian province. And now I live in Paradise, where I've been for the last eight years, Paradise, California. And since then, I've created dozens of so-called internet riddles. Have you ever heard of This Is Not Prawn? It's a, sort of a famous uh, internet riddle. Um, well, anyway, I, started, I think I started the concept of internet riddles because I created something called Cybertruck, and that came out before the, the prawn uh, game came out. I did Cybertruck in 2002. And so that's kind of my life history here in a nutshell, you might say. So I'd like, what time we got here? We're about another hour. Another, oh, we got another hour, okay. <laughs> well, okay, let's go back and do it again. <laughs> well, I'd like, to, I'd like to ask a question here. Um, maybe it's kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, why was, or maybe even still is, why, why is the Apple II such a popular computer? Yeah? Because it was open and you could, it became what you wanted it to do, what you wanted it to be as, as you changed interacting with it. Oh, okay, it yeah. It became a part of you while you were working. Does everybody agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Well, in addition, um, a lot of people were exposed to it because Apple pushed it to education. Uh huh. The first computer introduced the first. Computer. For, for me, it's. It's small and manageable, as I was talking to Ivan last night. You'll never be able to master everything about a Macintosh, but you can master the Apple II. Yeah, it was a small architecture, very limited memory and everything. Yeah, and, uh, there wasn't that much to know, basically, I guess, compared. It's like history, then, you know, the longer you live, the more history there is to know. <laughs> yeah? I always thought the Apple II was, I kind of regarded it as a toy more than anything. Well, I, I they even had so called game paddles. Like so to me, it seemed to be the most uh, professional yep. of the toys. Yeah, probably at that time, might have been, yeah. I always thought it was like the first one to implement everything graphics, sound, game input, the first one that had it all in one box. Yeah. Although yeah, primitive, but the first one at all. Yeah, there's probably a number of reasons, I guess, why, uh, why it's still around or why we even have this group, yeah? I think it's accessible in a way that computers aren't today. The idea that you can get a manual with your computer that tells you how to do anything you want to, including programming with the 64 commands or whatever, that were part of the machine, is unheard of. And it's something that's not replicated in today's machinery, which I think may be the reason for some of the longevity. Yeah, well, my, my reason, you know, as, as you probably guessed, is that it's because uh, you can program it. And it's fun and easy to, to do programming. And my philosophy is if you can't program a computer, then it's virtually worthless to me. That's why I haven't gotten into any of the, uh, I, the I things, the iPad and the I, iPhones and the I thises and the I thats. Now, those of you who aren't interested in programming, they may, you might ask the question, well, why would anyone want to write their own computer programs? Because uh, every time I try to tell somebody, well, I'd like to do programming, and they say, well, why? What do you want to do that for? Well, the anal I have an analogy that I, besides the fact that it's fun, look, look at this. A number of years ago, in the music industry, you would wa went out and paid a ticket and watched a performer sing, or you went to a concert or something, or you could buy records or whatever, recordings of professional singers. Lately, something called karaoke has come into play, where you do the singing. Now, you may not be as high quality professional as a, as a real singer, but uh, I, don't, I don't do karaoke myself, but those that do, do it because it's fun. They want to get up and entertain and sing their own songs and not listen to somebody else that's singing. And it's the same thing with programming. You can buy software. You can go out and buy something to solve some problem that you need. But it's more fun if you make it yourself. So programming is, is like karaoke on the computer, uh, computer analogy. And that's... That's right, yeah. Or do way more than you need it to, so you want to simplify it. 
Yeah, uh-huh. You can customize whatever you want. You want, like, like I told you, the first program I wrote was solving that square with the point inside. Where would you find software to do that? I mean, something you have to do yourself because it's a, it's a custom, custom thing. So when, you know, prior to the Mac, um, you know, certainly in the early 80s, like the CPM computers and even the IBM PC still came with some fairly technical manuals about things that you could do with it. The Mac was obviously very, very much not that. You weren't supposed to know how it worked. So yeah, and they wanted to make it all invisible to you. You know, the powers that be are going to be the gods, and they're going to do the stuff for you, and you just simply push your little mousey around and click buttons. So and you had a negative reaction to that, it sounds like. I have somewhat of a negative reaction to <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 in terms of current technology, are there any particular platforms or things on the web, or, or what, what, what excites you, or has that feeling of openness in the current day? Well, believe it or not, I didn't pay this guy to say that. I was just leading into my next part here. Suppose the Apple II had continued to evolve into a modern-day computer, one with you know billions of colors and sound capabilities and gigahertz processor speeds. <coughs> and suppose that the Apple II philosophy of supplying users with an easy to use programming language continued to come along to the 21st century as well. So you had something like AppleSoft or whatever, or the equivalent that would be applicable today. What would such a 21st century Apple II computer look like? Well, Apple didn't do any of those things, especially the part about the easy to program language thing. But I brought with you the next best thing, which is a programming language inspired by the Apple II. This, isn't, this is not a, uh, I'm not trying to clone an Apple II by any means. This was simply something I did based on inspiration of the Apple II and its philosophy of being easy to program. It's a language I created called SIMPLE. S-I-M-P-L-E, which is abbreviation for Simple Modular Programming Language and Environment. And I'm going to take some time to bore you with a few things about how you would use it to create your own software nowadays. Here's, a, here's the 21st century Apple II, basically. Now it can be used just like the Apple II. You can, uh, you can go in command line mode and type run. and, and well, let's, let's just write a very simple program. I'm going to first create a, a new text document. And I'll call it, uh, I'll call it junk. Jink. Jink. I'll call it jink. OK. It <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter. You have autocorrupt on there, too. <laughs> now, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to write a program. I'm going I'm to make a very, very trivial, simple program. I'm going to draw a circle. Just draw a circle. So, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if the aspect ratio is right on here. It may come out looking like an ellipse, but we'll see. Well, that happened on the Apple too, so why not? Why not? <laughs> so to draw a circle, I simply give a command. Let's make sure it's right. My students always spell it wrong. Uh, I'll put it somewhere on the, OK, you got three calling parameters. Well, the first one's going to be how far over, how many pixels over. Let's make it 400, we'll say. Second parameter, how far down, we'll make it 300. And the third parameter, how big do you want it to be, we'll make it 200. And there's a the program. Is that radius or? It's radius, okay. yeah. So we'll close this down, and we'll save it. Now I can run, there's two ways I can run it. I can start it up simple in uh, command line mode, so it looks kind of like an Apple II, and I'd say run what I call a jink. No, it is a circle. Cool. So that's how easy it is to write programs in this new Apple II environment, so-called. There's a second way you can run. You don't have to even go into command line mode. Here's our source listing again. I can simply take this thing and drag it onto the simple icon. And it automatically does everything for me and do the same thing. So it's, you run it in drag and drop mode, which is the, the more fun way of doing it. Let's go back and modify our program a little bit. That was a white circle. Let's say you want to make a red circle. So we'll say color. 
red. So we first pick a color, then we draw the circle, close it down, drag it onto the icon. Now we have a red circle. So that's the kind of, you know, not very exciting, but you, it gives you an idea of how easy it is to do stuff with the, this language. Now I have a couple of demos that I've uh, created here to show you some of the other things you can do once you get more sophisticated. One of which is this, this demo. This is all written in simple as well. This is somewhat interactive in that you can move, you can pick the angle you want to view this thing from. And then it goes. Huh? Is it 3D no, no, no. This is this is all done with simple t uh, modules that I created. Well, wasn't there like an OpenGL open library that you're leveraging the graphics card to render? Uh, I, I'm not. I, I guess I'm not. No, I'm not using any 3D anything. No. Uh, here's another. So what's under the hood? I mean, you're not. Are you, I mean, are you drawing pixels into raw memory? Uh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so wrong without the edgy lines. I know, right? Oh. Oh. <laughs> this, this is just, uh, you know... You know, I, I really think it is that crawl across the screen while you're waiting for the action that has sort of made your name legend in, uh, in the animated <laughs> community. Like, as opposed to just any other game where it's got your name credit, it's like, Bob Bishop presents. I add a few extra notes. <laughs> you change this pitch, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's. Uh, All right. <laughs> well, I've got a few other demo me. programs, huh? Yeah, I was going to ask more about simple. So, are what, what, where, how have you distributed this language? Is it? Are there interpreters for other platforms? Uh, it's distributed basically free of charge. You can also get on a flash drive and just plug it into a computer and, and, nice. and run it. Uh, but you can make your own flash drive very easy. You just go to the website, uh, download it, and put it on the flash drive. It takes and about. you need a Windows computer to use it? You need a Windows computer, yeah. It'll run on Windows 7, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 98, Windows 2000. It'll run on almost any version of Windows. It was developed on Windows 95. So it's been keeping up with Windows as, as time has gone by. Uh, the URL is uh, www.simplecodeworks.com. All lowercase. Uh, I don't know if we have internet here or not. I, I could, well, I'll let you. I'll let you guys do it if you want. Um, anybody who wants to continue it on any other platform can do so with my blessing. I mean, I'm I'm looking for volunteers to make this, you know, even better than it is. Is it open source? Yeah. Well, it's not open source. I can make it open source, but uh, right now it's it's just. Uh, most of simple is written in simple. Got it. And is there a, it does every, is everything simple does documented? Oh yeah, there's a, the documentation is online. There's a, a, a nine part tutorial. It tells you how to use simple. Uh, there are the, the, the libraries of all the capabilities are built. Well, in fact, I can show you. What are the parts that aren't written in C++? In fact, simple gives you the ability to intermix C++ with simple code, so you can live in both worlds. Um, can you talk a little bit about Cybertruck, which I actually tried to play and uh, didn't get far? <laughs> it's a tricky game. It is a tricky game. And it gets trickier as you go on. I don't want to. I don't want to develop too many of the tricks because otherwise that takes. There's only been two players in the world that made it all the way what through. Was the, what was the idea behind it, or the inspiration behind it, or? It was just an idea that I had. I mean, there weren't. There wasn't anything like it at the time. But I had this idea. What if? What if you made some uh, a website 
where you had a, a page that you start at, and instead of clicking to go to the next page, you have to figure out how to get to the next page. So I said, oh, well, we'll make some little puzzle question, and the, the URL will depend upon your answer. If you get the right answer, you go to the next page. So that was basically the idea behind uh, the start of Cybertruck. But I didn't, I didn't want it to be just uh, solve this puzzle and go there. I wanted them to have a storyline. So I wrote, made up the story about, uh, I think it was you and Corky. You're, you're the main player in the game. And so the two of you are going on, it's like an adventure game. You're going on an adventure, but you have to solve puzzles along the way to continue reading the story. And so that became Cybertruck. Uh, uh, yeah, Cybertruck. And originally Cybertruck was a one, one chapter game. And then I got the idea, we'll make Cybertruck 2, where you go off on a second adventure. And that led to Cybertruck 3, and pretty soon they all tied together. And at the end, I, was, I, I found a way to tie them all together and make the whole thing come to a nice conclusion, which I, I, had never, I didn't, never planned to go that far. I just kind of took it one wing at a time, and uh, was kind of lucky enough to make it all cohesive at the end. So if, if, you want to if you want to try playing that, just go to the same website, simplecodeworks.com, that has uh, all the, the Mr. Logic games uh, that were that have done. And are you continuing, continuing to develop those? I, the last one I did was about two years ago, so I guess I'm not really actively doing it at the present time, but I might start up again. Yeah? A request, I guess. It would be really nice if, if you open for it. Well, parts parts of it are already available. Uh, if you go to uh, let's see, if you go to the library. Uh, there are some sir, what I call tasks or subroutines are available. Wait a minute. No, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong library. Anyway, there is some source code for some of the uh, explosion tasks, the rocket drawing task, the UFO, and stuff like that. Um, I've been hesitant to release it because if I do that, there'll be so many different versions that if I need to upgrade something or change something, then we're you know we've got version A, version B, they're non-overlapping, but I think it's pretty much stabilizing. So I might I might just give you know, all the source away pretty soon. And then you can still control the master version. Yeah, I, I might do something like that eventually. Yeah, uh, here's um, here's here's the source listing for a little bit longer program, which just draws some shapes and explodes them, clears the screen to dark blue, draws some stars, draws a frame, draws a rocket, draws a smiley face, draws another UFO, a helicopter waits one second, <coughs> thousand milliseconds, and then explodes each one of those objects. What are the at signs at the end of each one for? Oh, the at, the at sign, because the, 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 all these rockets and UFOs are in a special library called the Penn Library, uh, as opposed to the system library like CLS, which doesn't require uh, an at sign because it's in, in the system library. Yeah, it's, it actually depends the, the source listings for those to your program. So if, if, they're ones that are user created. Yeah. <laughs> Cosmic is kind of an interesting one. This is a 3D kaleidoscope that I, that I came up with. Now this one, this one. See, I, you can you you can do graphics on your desktop like I did. Uh, well, the source listing is. It's a bit long. It's it's all of this.
Well, when you say well, different from what di you want to be able to do certain things and do them in a simple and clear way. Yeah, I wanted to do things because uh, uh, I had gotten out of the computer field back around the middle of, or late 1980s. I was just getting disappointed with what was happening. So I dropped out for a number of years. And when I came back in, uh, Windows was you know, prevalent. And uh, one of my friends, uh, who was a, a C++ programmer, was showing me C++. And it was so awkward and confusing. I said, why can't they make it easier? Why do, <laughs> why do we need all these semicolons? Why do we need these curly braces? Why, why? And so he says, well, well, how would you do it? And so I showed him how I would do it. And that's what led to simple. I would say it was primarily uh, inspired by Apple II uh, Basic and by Fortran. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to make a language, unlike, unlike JavaScript and uh, any of those other C++ languages with the myriads of semicolons and whatever, I tried to avoid the use of semicolons and curly braces as much as possible. So it looks more like Fortran than it does like any of the you know, common languages that are around today. Now you can use semicolons. In fact, here I have one right here. Uh, right here we have a semicolon. It's used as a delimiter between statements. You don't use it to end a statement like you do in C++, for example. But if you want to put more than one statement on the line, you can do it with a semicolon. Oh, by the, by the way, let me go back to uh, our program we wrote here, Jink. Uh, unlike other languages, you can freely put spaces anywhere you want, <laughs> e even in the middle of words. Apple uh, you can get rid of no, you need oh, spaces. Right. You need spaces there. Um, you can't no, say. It's, e gonna, it's tokenizer will parse based upon. E e even each tab. You can say H space tab. The only spaces it cares about are the ones that are in, inside quotes. Yeah, well, the same with simple. But can, there are only ones that count are inside quotes, yeah. Cool. Well, Pascal, 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 Pascal. I never got too much into Pascal, no. And, and given your interest in the web, are there any web development languages, you know, or, or, or current scripting languages? Like, I like looking at your code and I was thinking. Well, JavaScript, of course, but uh, uh, JavaScript, again, is uh, right. too C++-y. Right, I was wondering, like, languages like Python or those sorts of things. Do you I haven't, I haven't really gotten too much. See, I'm basically retired now. I'm trying to not get too much wow. into these things again. That's smart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I sh uh, technically, I retired when I left Apple Computer, and uh, I've been busier since then than I did when I was employed. <laughs> so... Uh, I figure it's time to actually be retired now. So I'm, I don't want to get too turned on to some new language or some new system because then I'm going to go back and, oh, boy, I'll be up all night working on it again. And uh, I've, I've gone through that. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah? Um, what's been the reception of children? What, what, what has been your experience with the youngsters? Who oh, I, t I teach them for that several of the schools. In fact, uh, uh, I have several, th about three or four students who are really good, become really good at Simple, and they've created their own games. Uh, let me see, I think I may have brought one with me here. Uh, we'll save it. have got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, so this is very interesting. Simples, games. No, I guess I did, I, I, I think I brought them, but I brought them on a flash drive, which I got lost. In, in transit, so I can't find it. One of them wrote a game called Mail 2, M-A-I-L, in which you have to shoot letters up at a at a postman while letters are dropping down, and it keeps track of score and everything. He he was he's a was a sixth grade student. I have another sixth grade student who, uh, know, a seventh grade student who did another race car game where you have to keep on a racetrack while the screen scrolls and everything. And uh, well, I've got a number of games like that that my students have made. So I mean, some of the, it, it's it's like anything. I mean, some some kids just aren't interested in programming, but the ones who are really like it. Um, well, it, re it uses the Windows APIs. Um, this is a game I made. Um, it's a 
it's a bomber game where you have to try to hit these targets. <laughs> so anyway, you 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 trot your drop bombs basically. You want to quit? Yes. Um, this is one kids like to play. We had this at a at a computer show a number of years ago, and there was a line of kids waiting to play it for some reason. Uh, it's a pong type game. Oops, I lost. Anyway, there's there's, there's literally hundreds of programs that have been written in Simple so far. Uh, I'm not going to show you them all. These are just uh, a few of the. Of and you've been dragging all the sources to the, uh, the compiler at the time. Will it generate PSTs? Will it? Sorry, what? Will it generate standalone PSTs? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. In fact, well, I, I just ran Cosmic a while ago, and here it is as an executable. All I have to do is click it, and it runs it automatically. You don't have to recompile it every time. No, it's going into actual, it's an actual executable for Windows. It doesn't require any external tools to be installed at all? No, it doesn't require any, it's self-contained entirely. Oh, wow. Well, it's, it, it requires, when you download, when you download the, uh, the package, it includes the C++ compiler as part of the package. So you don't have to bring anything else in. You just you download... C++ compiler as well? What? You wrote a C++ compiler as well? I, no, I didn't write the compiler. We're, oh. we're, we're using... A, 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 a compiler that's open to no. general use. So it's it's all it's all there. All you do is you go to the website, you down download a zip file, and you unzip it, and copy everything in the in that to a flash drive, we'll say, okay. and you're you're done. Or if you want to install it on your computer, you copy some folders to your C drive, and you're pretty much done. So it's very easy to install. It's very easy to use. The documentation is online. It's a nine-part tutorial. Uh, shows you how to draw circles, how to draw lines, how to do all the, you know, just about, doesn't show you everything, but gives you a good head start. Question? So how do you balance this, <coughs> which is really accessible and good to get people started, with assembly language? I mean, no offense, it's not simple. Yeah, assembly language, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I did I did tons of assembly language already, and I haven't done that now in years because there's no need to with languages like Simple, uh, especially if you're using things like the Windows APIs. All the primitives are already there. If you want to if you want to draw a line, or you want to uh, turn on a sound card, or you want to play music, or you want to whatever you want to do, the APIs there will pretty much do most of that for you. Doing what? Uh, yeah, because there are certain things you just couldn't, you could peek and poke, but that was way too slow, if you're especially an interpretive basic, and you wouldn't want to try to peek and poke, re you know, registers and so on. So you had to do certain things in assembly language. Although, I guess technically you don't need assembly language once you can access memory uh, other than for speed. You could pretty much do everything just in basic if you if you wanted to. I, I can't think of any, maybe somebody else can think of something. Can you think of a program that could not, in principle, have been written in BASIC on the Apple II? That was written in assembly language? Yeah. Other than for speed. Other than for speed? Yeah. <laughs> you can't write a disk card, you can't write a new DOS, Martin. Why not? <laughs> okay, because it depends on hardware time. This timing, hardware time. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. If it isn't, aside from timing considerations and speed, yeah. Yeah. Because in fact, I, I did most of my programming on Apple II like prototype and AppleSoft, and then if I needed speed, I would convert the AppleSoft into assembly. This is another. There have been thousands of downloads. I don't know who's actually doing what. And I, occasionally we get con contributions. You know, somebody will send us a program saying, "Here's a, a program I wrote." This is something Lucia Grossberger would have liked. It's an interactive kaleidoscope. Yeah. 
Yeah. You start you start off with you put the mouse anywhere you want, push the button and it draws the mirror of those dots and, and if you drag it it copies that mirror image, yeah. That's basically what a kaleidoscope is anyway. So one question that I have I, I noticed that all these ally boxes look like they're not standard Windows ally boxes. Is it able to do like standard Windows? It probably could. I mean, I, I, all the dialogue, like for example, this dialog box is one I made. It's right. built into the language, so you can make your own messages and with your own buttons on them and so on too. Yeah, they're not they're not strictly speaking Windows with a capital W. Okay. They're lowercase my Windows. Okay, that answers my question. Yeah. Talk briefly about the computing model of the variables, the data types. Did you keep real simple? Well, there are five data types. There's integer, double precision integer, floating, double precision floating, and text. And so those are the five data types you work with. I had thought of incorporating a sixth one, which would be a byte. I, we, I didn't do that. I left that out. Uh, it isn't necessary. It just would have been a way to, if you're dealing with small numbers, there's no sense wasting more than one byte. But I didn't put I didn't put that one in, unfortunately. But do you need to declare those types as part of the programming, or is it implicit? Uh, well, you, if you have, if you want to make a, a, a text, uh, well, here well, let's go back and do that, and we'll we'll, we'll go back to our uh, our circle jinx program here. So I'll draw my my circle, and let's say at the beginning of the program, for some reason, I wanted to declare uh, text uh, a. Now, it isn't necessary to do that. Okay, it's not necessary. It's not ne no, I could just say, for example, well, here, let's do it the right way. You only need to do that if you need to do it. Uh, if I wanted to say, for example, A equals, quote, hello, that's all I do. Yeah. And then, and then if I want to display that later on for some reason, I could say display uh, A. Oops, display A. <laughs> And then that would just draw the circle and display hello. Got it. Yeah, it's it's meant to be as as, as non uh, mi to minimize the requirement of you initializing anything. You don't have to declare pound sign includes. You don't have to declare a main program. You don't have to declare you don't have to declare anything. You just go in and start writing code. So if you said a equals hello display a and then said a equals three point one four and said display a, would it then make that? No, it would get a compiler error. Okay. Once you have a type, you can't. You, you, yeah, you, that's right. You has to it has to maintain the type. You can't change types midstream. Okay, and so if you define a equals one and then said a equals a minus point five, it would have assumed that it was an integer at first. Yes, if you say a equals one, if you say a equals one point zero, then it'll declare it to be floating. Yeah, once you've used once you've used uh, a name, it, that name sticks through the rest of the of the that. Uh, uh, compiler so that you, if you would like to declare the declare or definition of your variable anywhere in the program, it has that type everywhere in the program. Yeah, in that in the main program portion, you can create your own subroutines in which you you rename them because. Each module is completely separate. The of scope. Yeah, the scope of yeah the scope the scope of, the, of of any name is only in the the module in which it resides. You can't define a scope that will apply to universe, universe thing within. Yeah, you can. There are, you can declare something to be in common, and that will be in common with every sub uh, module that you have. Yeah, I I, don't, I can't I, I could show you examples, but I think it'd be taking us a little bit. Oh, Well, only if you're going to put it in common. Then you have to declare it to be in common. But if you just want to make it in the in the in the scope of the module itself, you just have like we did here. Uh, you say a equals hello. Well, that's all you need. Now, if I wanted a to be in common with another module, I could say common text a, and then I could use that. I don't remember. I. I <laughs> I always declare everything at the beginning, just out of habit. Yeah, right. Well, that's a good way to do it. 
Yeah, but it might work the other way too. I don't. It depends on where. How, I don't remember how we scan through the the sequence of things. Yeah. Question. You're asking for my opinion only on this? Well, my opinion... Well, I have maybe somewhat of a biased opinion in that you know, I have my, my motives for, like I said before, if I can't program something, it's virtually useless to me. And Apple has gone the way of iPhones and they become a phone company more than a computer company. And I, I, want, I want to play with computers, and so Apple is kind of going its own way from my personal interests. Now that doesn't mean to say everybody else doesn't like it, but uh, from my point of view, it's not what I, it's not my cup of tea. Well, I mean, I guess he, I guess it's somewhat impressive that they've got, you know, the iPads and stuff that where you can, it's basically a flat screen computer you carry with you. Uh, that's kind of a neat idea. It's too bad it's not an Apple II that you can do that with, though. I mean, if, you, if they had an easy, if they could put simple on an iPad, I'd love it. <coughs> I'd actually go buy one. <laughs> well, you could put simple on an iPad. Oh, no, they don't like no, it. They, no, they don't, because we could. the language. Yeah. I'd like to forward some questions from the back channel. The number one question is from Sheppy, and he asks, how long did Apple Vision take to write? It might sound silly, but it really opened my eyes as to what you could make the Apple II do. It took about, oh, I'd say it probably, I wasn't working on it full time. I mean, it was just something I kind of threw together, cause, and I didn't really know where it was going. I was just playing with graphics at the time. And one thing's kind of led to another, and I'd add some feature here and there. Probably about two weeks, I guess, from start to finish. Uh, I, I, go, I went to I went to a, a library and got a dance book. It was a big dance book that had a dancer in different poses, some woman dancer. Actually, the Apple Vision man is actually a woman. <laughs> and I took I took I traced the pictures from the book on, on graph paper, and I put X's on all the squares that were going to be you know filled in. And I had several different poses from this dancer, and I digitized them by hand, put the ones and zeros where they belong, stored them away, and then wrote a program to sequentially display them depending upon whatever one I wanted. And so it was really just an exercise in doing animation initially. <coughs> and then pretty soon, I, once I had this thing animated, well, I said, well, what am I going to do? Well, I can put on a little TV set, so I drew a TV. Well, what am I going to do with the TV? Let's put it in a room. Well, I need music too, you know, so it just kind of evolved from one to another. I, I never really planned anything there. It was just kind of a hodgepodge. And uh, that's, that's how it ended up Apple Vision. On the one I did now? Apple Vision. Or right, Simple Vision. Which one are you talking about? Yeah. It, it was something that was displayed on the text screen and you made high res graphics of it, or did you do a double high double low res split thing that you No, I didn't do any splitting, not at that time. I did splitting later on. I, I did split screen where I had graphics on the bottom and text on the top. Uh, but the Apple Vision was just pretty straightforward, nothing really fancy. It was just uh I I I'm trying to remember how I, I it's been so long I can't remember some of the technicalities. Uh I think what I did was I I I well, I had a text generator, and there's a, actually there is a bug. There's an error in the text generator that I use. 
if you go through and display all the characters, the back, I think you see the backslash or the forward slash has a dot out of place. But I, I don't use that character, so it, it didn't matter. Um, I think I designed it, I, I think. Uh, otherwise, uh, that, w that bug probably wouldn't have been there. <laughs> I, I don't remember. It's been, like, again, it's been so long, I don't remember whether I did or whether I got it from somebody else. Uh, all I remember is that uh, I had to write part of it in, in integer basic, because AppleSoft wasn't out in those days. And the other part was custom assembly language stuff that I threw together which was really the main emphasis of what I was doing. It was just to play around with assembly language. And this, this, this is a 